I've been dealing with a blackboard issue, so I'm going to just move forward with what I can do now, and hopefully within a few hours it will change, um, but I'm just trying to get everything done, and it's, and they locked me out of blackboard, so kind of interesting. All right, so we watched Dazed and Confused and Moonlight this weekend. It's our last weekend of the semester. Um, we only have two days left in class now, and so let's get started. Moonlight, a 2016 film, a coming-of-age drama written by written by Barry Jenkins. Um, it definitely ties into uh, masculinity and uh, you know sexual and gender identifications, and the last concept which we're going to be talking about, which is intersectionality and so uh, the film is presenting these three stages in life of the main character and it was his childhood adolescence and early adult life and it, it explores the difficulties he faces with his sexual sexuality and identity including physical and emotional abuse that endured that he endured growing up and it's based out of uh, Florida and um, it actually did really well so um, the budget was about 1.5 million and it box officed uh, 65 million so it did really well um, it was actually um, the director Barry Jenkins um, you know was very much involved in the marketing and in really getting this film in the places that it needed to be in so I posted these videos um, so that we could go over a little bit about you know what the film was showing us but unfortunately with this screen recorder I had to go back to zoom and with the zoom it, it does well with uh, the replay of videos but um, with uh, my screen recorder it doesn't and it has that like echo so you'll have to go into the website and watch these yourself. This is just a clip of, you know, that moment of them showcasing the masculinity and this movement of, you know, becoming um, masculine and black, right, in um, the development of that identification for himself. Um, so... Uh, the wiki actually gets into some of this black identification, black mas masculinity, um, and so I'm going to make this a little bigger. The film's co-writer uh, speaks on the topic of black masculinity um, in the film, explaining why uh, um, Chiron went to such lengths to alter his persona. He argues that communities without privilege or power seek to gain it in other ways. He says one way in which males in such communities do this is by trying to enhance their masculine identity, knowing that it often provides a means to more of a social control in the patriarchal society. So you know, this is dealing with class systems, right? Hegemonic order, and then the development of identification due to that. And so, you know, towards the end of this course, obviously, we, you know, this is the kind of, this is the concepts we're talking about, which are more social rather than formal. Um, and this film is, is touching on, on that development itself. In Moonlight, masculinity is portrayed as rigid and aggressive amongst the behavior of young black males in Chiron's teenager peer group. The expression of hypermasculinity among black men has been associated with peer acceptance and community. Being a homosexual within the black community, on the other hand, has been associated with social alienation and homophobic judgment by the peers because black gay men are seen as weak um, in the film Chiron is placed on this divide as a black gay man and alters his presentation of masculinity as a strategy to avoid the ridicule um, because homosexuality is used as, used as an incompatible with black masculine expectations 
So as young kids, Kevin hides his sexuality in order to avoid being singled out like, um, like Chiron is. As Chiron grows older, he recognizes the need to conform to that heteronormative ideal of black masculinity in order to avoid abuse and homophobia. And so then as an adult, Chiron chooses to embrace the stereotypical black male gender performance by becoming this like muscular drug dealer, right? So we saw in the film. Moonlight explores the effects of this felt powerlessness in black males and as McCraney explains coping with this feeling often coincides with attempts to overstate one's masculinity in a way that can easily become toxic he says one unfortunate side effect of leaning into masculinity too much is that men no longer want to be caressed or nurtured or gentle which is why a character like Juan may be puzzling to some audiences um, so then Wiki gets into the intersection, right? And so we haven't talked about intersectionality just yet. So what I'm going to do is now we're going to go to intersectionality. And the idea um, of intersectionality, right? And so with intersectionality, it's, it's a concept of uh, all of the different identifications of what you are made into a flower, right? And so as you can see here, we have the circle of race. So whatever race you are, it would be there. And then you have, if you have a disability um, or something like this, right, um, including ADHD or, you know, hyperactivity or... Um, depression right that would be in that in that realm there then your sexual orientation um your gender identification and your nationality and so the idea is that they all intersect right and they become layers of who who you are um and so if we see and there's another video here so i'm going to pause and go back over to um intersectionality. I feel like that. There we go. So within Moonlight, the intersection of blackness, masculinity, and vulnerability occurred, right? So blackness, um, masculinity, and vul vulnerability are major focuses of the film. In the beach scene with Chiron Wan and his father figure in the film emphasizes the importance of black identity. Wan says there are black people everywhere. Remember that, okay? No place you can go in the world ain't got no black people. We, we was the first on this planet. As Wan speaks about the relevance and importance of the black experience, he also thinks about a time in his youth when a stranger told him in moonlight, black boys look blue. This is an image that the audience gets to see as the director, Barry Jen Jenkins, supplies numerous shots of Chiron in the moonlight. It seems that Juan seems to associate this image with vulnerability, given that he tells Chiron that he eventually shed the nickname Blue in order to foster his own identity. Throughout the film, this dichotomy between black and blue stands in for that that between tough and vulnerable with the black body often hovering between the two in Chiron's situation the black body which can be seen as inherently vulnerable in American society but must be tough in order to survive as seen by Chiron's final very masculine and dominant identity and so um you know Again, you'll please watch this on your own. Um, Moonlight Exploring Masculinity and Black Masculinity. It's a 16 minute long video that gets into, you know, the director speaks about the characters. It talks about, you know, how, you know, a play by play of where masculinity was shown and broken down um, within the film. So it's, it's, it's awesome. And it's a great way, you know, we were watching these videos because again, you all are, you all have learned about how do you, how do you speak about these concepts after watching a film or even during watching a film. And so when you, when you review uh, like a YouTube channel like this, that's talking directly about moonlight, exploring masculinity and black masculinity, um, it just gives you tools in your toolbox to speak about about it. So going back over to this model of intersectionality, um, one thing, if you click on it, it's going to take you to this video. And this video breaks down intersectionality dealing with discrimination. And so the idea is that, you know, you, you can be discriminated on, um, for more than one, uh, 
part of who you are, right? And so within intersectionality, um, it becomes not only that you are black, but also that you are a female um, black woman with a disability, right? And so it's like, it's that intersection that, that lies in the center becomes part of that stronger a way of of finding discrimination um and specifically within like workforce and concepts like these so so you know intersectionality usually is used um up when it when we're talking when, when you hear it you'll hear it in regards to discrimination but what we're talking about is identification really um and and this idea of us being um, not just being identified as a black woman, a white woman, um, you know, a bisexual white woman, right? So understanding that this development of your identification when it comes to film and culture and this development of your intersectionality um, in part is some is choice, right? There are concepts here that are by choice. And so within this concept and our exposure um we become we we develop our identification right and so you know that's where when you think about femininity stereotypes and masculinity and those stereotypes and understand that within intersectionality there are there are these stereotypes that occur and they get they get placed upon us due to dominant ideology and due to how we've been influenced um by film, right? And how film showcases th this intersectionality and showcases this dominant ideology, right? And so it's interesting that the wiki gets into those intersections a little bit when it comes to Moonlight and the, the intersections that it talks about is the idea of being an African American male, being and um, being masculine, but being vulnerable, right? And so there's this intersectionality of like, those things are not allowed, right? You can't be an African American, masculine and vulnerable male, which it, it, it's that's not the case, right? And that's what Moonlight is, is actually showing us that that actually you can, but unfortunately, this is part of the patriar patriarchal hegemonic order that has developed a certain ideology for these people. And so Moonlight is representing that. Um, so again, um, when you go to the page, this is right now, this is on our first page. Um, when you click here, this is what you'll see. And this is going to take you to the intersectionality um, link. But you want to go ahead and this is just a scene of that development of his mas of masculinity development. But you do want to watch this video. Now we're going to move into... Um, dazed and confused and some of you might be confused about like how does this have anything to do with um intersectionality masculinity right um w which in a way i feel like moonlight is is a very heavy film and i feel like that those underlining tones and the theme of the of that film um is very heavy in a sense that uh, of where we are in society and like just how, you know, we're growing, um, in a society for sure things are changing, but you know, culturally we're still behind and there's still a lot of this dominant ideology that, that, um, controls our hegemonic order. Right. And so saying that, you know, dazed and confused is on the lighter end of things, but it also has a, a, a hegemonic order that it shows us. It also has a patriarchal system that it shows us. And there is some major um, stereotypical roles in this film that, that we, that we can talk about. Right. So Dazed and Confused, 1993, American coming-of-age comedy written by Richard Linklater, and this was one of his first films. The film featured a large ensemble of cast actors who would later become huge stars. So all of the, the actors, this was like some of their first films, and so, you know, that was majorly um, a part of why it became a cult classic, because of who the director chose uh, to be in the film, right? So it was released in 1993. It was a commercial disappointment at the box office grossing less than 8 million and so when we look at you know 
what they put into it, 6.9 million, almost 7 million, and it only grossed eight. Um, so that, you know, that, that's why it was such a disappointment, right? Um, and so it, you know, it gets into what this film's about. And, um, it does talk a little bit about some of the political, uh, concepts of the film in the wiki, but it doesn't get in, I feel like it doesn't really get into those um, deeper concepts like it stays on the surface whereas with the Moonlight Wiki it really got into some of the more deeper stuff so these two videos um, I really like the Dazed and Confused first one what makes this movie great because again it's like as we wrap up this semester uh, like what this man is doing in this video is is going over the film he's doing exactly what we learned about in this course of how do you talk about you know the theme of the film, how do you talk about the way the film um, was created, what the directors did, how the cinematography was, what were the themes of the characters, right? And so he talks a lot about how there's it jumps around into these different themes, but they do a really good job with their continuity editing and like keeping it all together. And so, um, so that was really great because again, we're getting into some formal elements. And then he gets into, you know, some of the more social elements in regards to the roles and the characters and how there was so many character development in there was so much character development within the film um which is actually really hard to do um even though it seemed like you know kind of like just this funny on the surface film he also gets into the themes of um, how there was bullying in the film and that was made to be normal, which at that time it was right. And so now, you know, we're, we're kind of moving away as a society. We're moving away from that because politically it's not okay anymore. Right. And, and so that's been shown in the light that bullying and, and that sort of concept of paddling and, and, you know, just doing these sort of things to the freshmen, right, are, is no longer really accepted and it's frowned upon um, now. And so he talks about those themes, but what's interesting is um, this film, this um, video, talks about the masculinity in crisis and how the, the roles of masculinity in Linklater's, the director's films, is definitely a theme that people are seeing and these roles of masculine characters and heroes and how um, they, they, you know, how they are created. So you definitely watch Watch these two so you can have a, a good idea about these themes especially if you don't if you're having trouble connecting with dazed and confused those videos will definitely help you um so now I want to go back over to intersectionality and talk a little bit again about this um overall concept of hegemonic order and this connection between dominant ideology hegemonic or order patriarch patriarchal uh, society within Hollywood. And so, you know, why is ide ideology so important and how or when did it come about in the media, right? And so there was, there's some videos that I added into this, but that kind of talk about exactly what this article stated. But I brought in the, the book because I found this book at the library and it's basically, you know, sometimes when you get on the YouTube channels, um, um, some of this information, you know, it is it is done by people just like you and me. Um, it could be done by someone who's not a professional, right? And so, you know, that's one of those situations that when you're doing your research and you're, and you're pulling information from something like YouTube and it's something that's deeper that you want to make sure that you're getting the right information, that's where you have to do your research. Use the library resources and find something that backs up what you're finding through these YouTube channels, right? So that's exactly what I did here because I feel like what is being introduced um, as our last week of class is, um, you know, very, very almost heavy. Um, it, no, it is heavy. It is heavy. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know that this information is, is real. It's factual, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and start from the top. Um, this is a case study in the book, International Communication. And so it talks a little bit about uh, TV channels and um, children's TV channels, right? And so between the years of 90, 1996 and 1999, there were more than 
50 children's channels that were launched and became an integral part of the international television market, okay? 50 children's channels. So by 2016, there were 400 specialist children's channels worldwide, and they were majority in English, okay? So th this is influencing children around the globe, Okay, and it's in English, so it's being translated. Um, as the numbers have grown, the channels have increasingly adapted to the local languages, but YouTube has become a global children's TV staple as well. For historical reasons, the U.S. television companies are the largest producers of children's programs, a significant portion of which are animated. One advantage of animation is that it translates well um, in overseas markets since cartoons require a minimum of cultural interpretation based based as they are stylized characters so they can they can change the language pretty easily the USA was the first country to have a specialized children's channel when Nickelodeon was launched in 1979. By 2016, Disney was operating more than 100 Disney channels in 34 languages and 164 countries. So the reason why I bring this to you is because of the influence that we have globally on children, right? So when you think about Hollywood and you think about USA and you think about what is where what we've learned right that tells you that everything that we are creating in this nation becomes global right from for children and so this is a dominant ideology that we that we show through Hollywood that gets influenced throughout the world okay one key reason for the U.S. domination of global entertainment marketing is its film industry. Hollywood films are shown in more than 150 countries worldwide. While American TV programs are broadcast in over 125 international markets, the M MPAA, whose members include Walt Disney, Paramount, right? Sony, 20th Century Fox, Universal Studios, and Warner Brothers serves as the voice and the advocate of the American motion picture, home video, and television industries. Film must be placed within an entire social, economic, and political context and critiqued in terms of contribution to maintaining and reproducing structures of power especially since the U.S. film industry developed global marketing techniques as early as 1920s and continues its dominant position in international media markets today. We are, we've dominated it ever since. Our dominant ideology is what dominates the, the ideology of the globe. Hollywood no longer or rarely grabs territory, but grabs consciousness, ways of thinking, ways of living. Others have noted the political dimensions of Hollywood hegemony in blockbusters, such as Independence Day in 96, military-themed superhero films, such as Captain America and Iron Man series. These were produced with an ad hoc cooperation from the U.S. federal government via the public affairs offices of specific military branches, including the Marine Corps Corps Motion Picture and TV Liaison Office, the Air Force Entertainment Liaison Office, the U.S. Army Community Relations Office West, and the Navy Office of Information West. Some have questioned whether Hollywood's military-themed entertainment has a role in legitimizing and popularizing post-9-11 warfare and in reinforcing the gun culture in the U.S. Now, saying that, um, the last sentence is an opinion. That's why it said some have wondered. But understand that there is a branch for every branch of military um, that is within motion pictures. There is a branch in the military that implements Hollywood motion pictures and literally supports them financially as well. Scholars have pointed out that racism also afflicts Hollywood as its dominant narrative of whites as heroes and actors of color as sidekicks or villains legitimate and reproduce racial hierarchies existent in the U.S. society. A study drawing on industry statistics and interviews with Hollywood personnel reported that a set of predominantly white male creative talent business executives and gatekeepers breeds a culture of 
ethnocentric storytelling and casting. Others have shown how Hollywood films and television shows have de depicted a male Arabs as villains or terrorists and women portrayed as belly dancers or shrouded in veils. The theme song of Disney's Aladdin proclaimed that Aladdin hailed from a faraway place where the caravan camels roam, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. The 1994 blockbuster True Lies featured a fictional terrorist group called the Crimson Jihad, a trend which Oz become more pronounced in the post 9-11 era and the age of the war on terror. So, again, that article is insane. Um, it's in a book that I currently have um, called International Communication that I checked out at the library. Um, when we go back to thinking about hegemonic order, a particular distribution of power and hierarchy that results from the work of hegemony in practice. So the hegemony is the process by which a given social system wins the voluntary consent of its members to just accept their place in the hierarchy. So according to the research above and the below articles, where does Hollywood and Disney stand when it comes to their hegemonic place? So I need to delete this. Head over to the theater chat and answer this by Wednesday because that... I'll delete that, sorry. Um, Nichols talks about on page 296 that hegemony and how to get individuals to freely accept the constraints of a given ideology in exchange for benefits of social belonging, handling routine situations, and acquiring a picture of what the world is like. The proof is in the data that Hollywood dominates this hegemonic relationship with the world um, as a whole, right? And so these two videos are talking about exactly what that stated in the article that uh, and it gives us way more details these two videos give you way more details on how uh, the military was involved in the making of these films and what it is that they chose to focus on and also a little bit of what they needed to be liable for in regards to what are they showing and it had to be uh, f factual right it had to be like if they're depicting something that happened within a war it needs to be what happened within that war right um but again, this is Hollywood. And so um, there were ways, it, like we've learned, um, with masculinity, with, um, you know, heterosexuality, with um, the stereotypes that even though it was wrong, it was still shown. And until the proper laws and the proper um, political agendas passed, until that happened, it, it was still there and it was still, it already had a huge effect on society as a whole because it already was shown. So it's, it's just such a very, very important point and, and quite startling as well. Um, uh, just to know how, how influential we are. And I know as a society, we know that because of the way that we've experienced media, but when you break down film and culture and we break down all of these stereotypes and we break down the social class system and we break down, you know, what has happened in history, when you see it from this full picture, it really is a daunting concept, right? And so there was um, an issue that was happening in Florida and this is, this is about that. Um, and this was, I think, about a, yeah, so, so it might have been about a year ago. It might have been more than that. But um, it has to do with Disney and its effect on the LGBTQ community and, and kind of what they were choosing to do uh, moving forward. Um, so, so again, um, we're going to go back to, unless this isn't updated, let's see. Because I did post. Oh, it's here. Okay. So going back to, you know, again, these major connection, connections with this concept of hegemonic order and the development of dominant ideology and the identification and, and the preferences of that, as well as being able to speak in full about film and tying in all of these concepts that you guys have learned about this semester. Um, 
when you think about your last journal that's due this Friday and the short essays that you're going to have on your final exam, you want to be feeling like you're able to write and think about, about the films we have watched watched in this well-rounded form, right? So you want to be considering all of these concepts. And so that's why I feel like watch these videos that I've given you because, you know, you it's likely that you will be writing about that, right? So make sure you watch these videos, make sure you take notes when you're watching these videos. And that way you have tools, um, when you go into your final exam to write about these things if you if you have a hard time with being able to write about it like that kind of off the off the uh, cuff right because I'm not giving you the the um, prompts ahead of time this time you are actually writing your there's going to be two and so you are writing short essays in the final exam um, based on prompts that you're given during the final exam so there's going to be more time on the exam for you guys to do that um, for sure so I'm, I'm definitely going to open that up to where you guys have more than enough time for that and then um, secondly I'm going to also keep the final exam open basically for the whole week. So next Monday, the final exam will open and then it will close on Friday. So you'll have the whole week. You can allot the time that you need to take it, but it will be open between that whole week for you guys. And then, um, and yeah, so for your discussion, uh, this week, uh, I'm going to make this also due on Friday, so you'll have your journal number three due on Friday and then this discussion due on Friday. That way you guys have time, especially considering I, uh, because I, I'm locked out of my blackboard, so I'm not, I don't know when I'm going to be able to actually give you guys this, hopefully within the next few hours, but this has never happened to me. I don't know why this happened, but it just is what it is. So the discussion is you're going to reflect on both films. Um, Moonlight and Dazed and Confused. And I want you to just use three terms from our book while you're reflecting on both films. So take some notes on the side, have your three terms for each film and, and state them, right? If you could watch any film in this course, what would that film be? So I want to know, like, if I want it, like, I, I, I feel like I could use, um, I want a better film for the femininity and identi identification uh, part. Uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, I think, is a good one. Um, but before we watched Wonder Woman, and I know a lot of people really liked it, but I just felt like um, it didn't really get into that deeper concept. And I feel like these are pretty deep concepts, and there's there are films out there that... Um, tap into that. So I don't know if you guys could uh, watch any film in this course that you think could be a great film that relates with the content. Let me know which one you think I should add to the syllabus. That's how a lot of the films this semester got added in. Um, Top Gun, Dazed and Confused, Idiocracy. Those are actually all, um, oh, uh, Forrest Gump. Those were all, um, suggested by students in the past. Um, number three, what was your favorite film of this semester and your least favorite film? So just which one did you really like? Which one did you not like? I do listen to that one. Um, and I have taken films off uh, based on what you guys said. And then how do you think you will continue using film and culture in your life moving forward? Um, so this is kind of a long journal, I'm um, sorry, a long discussion. Um, I will probably weight it a little heavier because there is a lot of information that I'm asking you guys to reflect on here. Um, but, but yeah, so it, it could be that I, I might put it into, um, our journals. So in regards to the weight of your journals, you have the first journal that we wrote. Um, the, the second one is on social class, which I, I want to grade. I haven't graded that yet. So the second one is the discussion that we did that was based on social class and um, the Hunger Games. The third journal is the one that you're turning in on Friday. And then this one I might put in there, um, but not as heavily weighted as these three. But I might, because it's longer, I might, I might decide to put that in there just to um, kind of even out some of the weight of, of your, of the course. So, um, saying that, that's pretty much it. Uh, so again, uh, when you go to FNC 23, uh, this is the link that's going to take you to the intersectionality part. So I would definitely watch these videos, 
um, that are that are posted here. Um, and then, yeah, watch the videos within the intersectionality. Watch the description of the intersectionality, right, as a review. And then you're pretty much done. Um, good luck with your journals. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, once I get back into my Blackboard, I really prefer if you guys actually, if you have questions about the journals, if you have questions about the final, uh, send it through Teams because I think that everyone can... Uh, uh, if everyone sees the question, that way it answers it for everybody. So I'd prefer to chat in teams about any of those kind of questions. Um, but yeah, pretty much almost everything is graded. Uh, your running total is there. And so the last few things that I need to grade would be that that uh, social class journal, the journal you're turning in on Friday, um, and then this discussion. And so other than that, um, everything else is pretty much there. So you wanna go in and you wanna make sure all your grades reflect what they should be. What happens is if you turn something in late and I graded it, and it's still showing a zero, but when you go in, you can see I graded it, but the zero is there, then that you wanna email me and say, Blackboard is not reflecting my grade correctly. Can you change it for this for this assignment? Because the problem is it's a glitch and I can't I can't see which one it does it to. So you need to be the one to look. So go into your grade book and make sure you catch that. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure, you all. I know it's been kind of a an interesting semester. I know for me, I have to be really honest, this has been one of the hardest semesters I've had um, with just uh, technology and connecting, um, you know, just just trying to create a good bridge from this class being face-to-face -to, -face to an online class. But I'm working on it, and um, I think for the most part, you guys did really well. Everyone, you know, participated and did the discussions, and I feel like you guys really took to, you know, kind of like the learning curve of the course, and I really appreciate that. I really appreciate your patience and your creativity and just, you know, being authentic, you know, telling us how you really felt about things. Um, it really help me seeing your faces on YouTube connect with you guys and, and know who you are. So, so I really appreciate all of your efforts and um, I hope you guys have a great summer and yeah, thank you so much.